highlights of today's Doug Peterson press conference. John McMullen from 97.3 ESPN.com. He was there, and uh, we'll get his takes from today's press conference where Doug Peterson addressed the media. Uh, getting ready for a Pittsburgh Steelers team, John, that uh, many think uh, could be one of the top two, three teams in football right now. Uh, they've, ch- you know, one of the things that I think Pittsburgh has got better is one across the line, but they're much better defensively, uh, especially in that secondary than they than they have been the last couple of years. Yeah, they struggled recently, specifically at the corner position. So they've improved a little bit there. Uh, and they've changed their philosophy a bit from that Dick LeBeau 3-4 attacking defense we're all so familiar with. And now uh, that he's gone, he's in Tennessee, it's it's morphed into more zone coverage, which is sort of Mike Tomlin's background as a, uh, as a Tampa 2 guy. He started under Tony Dungy, Leslie Frazier, people like that. So uh they're they're morphing a little bit it's a little bit different and it's clear the strength of this team has shifted uh the sides of the ball it's offensive uh, offensively they they might be the best team in football and that's without Le'Veon Bell and Martavis Bryant so that tells you how good they could have been and the Eagles will catch a little bit of a break they won't face Bell and they'll still have Johnson uh, for this game, and the Steelers are healthy, which is something, John. Before we dive into Peterson and the Eagles stuff, uh, you know, John covers the league nationally for uh, today's pigskin.com. Uh, there's a lot of national stories that I think we should dive into before we dive into this matchup a little uh, deeper because it kind of morphs into what we're saying. They don't have Bell, Johnson will be there. Uh, they do not have a lot of injuries, but injuries are all over this league including in Minnesota, what does the Peterson injury do to the Vikings? Uh, It hurts. I I don't want to understate when you lose a Hall of Fame talent, even as numbers through the first two games were terrible. A lot of that had to do with just how poorly the offensive line was playing. Uh, And in a weird way, uh, Jarek McKinnon, who a lot of people are going to figure out is a pretty good player, in the upcoming weeks is a better fit for what Norv Turner wants to do. Uh, he's a more well-rounded back. He's a good receiver. Uh, but the last time Adrian was gone, when he was suspended, if you remember that, McKinnon uh, started, played very well, averaged about five yards a carry, and then he got hurt. So uh, that's one of the things you have to keep an eye on, whether he can take the, the pounding uh, that a bell cow back will see. But it's, the narrative just changed in Minnesota. Matt Khalil, their left tackle, also went on injured reserve today. So the thought was that Sam Bradford would be playing with the best supporting cast, and now all of a sudden you, you lose a Hall of Fame running back, you lose a left tackle who was once the fourth pick in the draft, uh, and all of a sudden it's not looking quite as good. Although, as I said, the 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 dark reality is Khalil and Peterson weren't playing well. So I, I think in a weird way, it's not going to hurt them that much. Uh, it puts a lot more in Bradford's lap, or no? Do they continue to go with the same formula? No, same formula. TJ Clemmings, if you remember him, is going to step in and play left tackle. Uh, he was a great uh, college player at Pitt probably was going to be a first-round pick and then had a knee injury, tumbled down the board a bit. Uh, He's very athletic, and I think he'll be an upgrade. I really do. Uh, As for McKinnon, not an upgrade. Anytime you lose a, as I said, you're talking about, if not the best pure runner who's ever lived, he's right there with whoever you want to mention, Jim Brown, Walter Payton, Barry Sanders. He's in that category. But Norv Turner didn't use him correctly. So if Norv Turner is going to continue to be Norv Turner, and there's no evidence that he's not, he would rather have Jarek McKinnon play. So that's in the weird way I look at it and saying, for what Norv wants to try to accomplish, this actually helps him uh, because he is a running back who can catch the football in the flats. 
Uh, John McMullen here on the Sports Bash, of course, covers the league nationally for today's pigskin.com. A lot of national stories out here. We'll go to, uh, you know, from the Vikings with their injured running back over to the Colts where they're going to lose Dante Moncrief. This is a team that's 0-2, and now – you know, injuries starting to, uh, you know, steer their ugly head into their season. How big of a loss is Moncrief to that team? It's big, but I, I think obviously the bigger issues in Indianapolis are defensively. They weren't very good, and they've had a ton of injuries on that side of the ball. And then for years on the offensive line, it's been one of those things. And we talked about it a little on the show yesterday, Mike. It's, it's not just Indianapolis. It's all over the league. It's Seattle. It's Green Bay. Uh, We just talked about Minnesota. Uh, Really, teams that are supposed to be good have poor offensive lines, and you could never say that in the past. If you looked at good teams in the NFL, almost every single one of them had a strong offensive line. But things have shifted so dramatically at the college level. Uh, These guys come in unprepared similar to the quarterback position from playing spread offenses. Uh, They're not up to speed, and it can get really, really ugly. Uh, And that's why you're seeing some of those ugly offensive football games, even with people like Luck under center and Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson. These guys can't block. It's really really amazing how quickly it's enveloped the league. It's almost like a virus. No doubt about it. Uh, we talked about it yesterday, how bad the offensive line play is all over football. And uh, a couple other uh, injury notes here. Um, you look at a lot of people, you and I yesterday, struggled to find a second wild card team. What does losing Doug Martin mean to Tampa Bay? It means a lot. I mean, he he was he was second to Adrian Peterson in, in the, for the rushing title last year. So he's coming off a great year. Uh, that was part of their strength. You look at them on paper. It's They had the quarterback. They had the running back. Uh, had big receivers to get the football to. And they looked like a young team ready to take that, take that next step. I, I look at that Arizona. That was a bad situation for them. Because I, I think the Cardinals are, are, if not the most talented team in football, one of the top two or three. And they were embarrassed coming off that season opening loss to New England without Brady and Gronk and all those guys. Uh, They were embarrassed, and they just put one on them. So I kind of gave them a mulligan for that performance. Uh, I still think they might be relevant. But, yeah, I mean, they they need Doug Martin, and that's going to be difficult to overcome when he's not there. Charles Sims uh, will take over in his absence there. Uh, John, you know, we continue to talk about you know, the running back spot. It just seems like every team is just kind of finding guys, plugging them in. It, it kind of goes to the diminishing role of the running backs in the NFL. It's just, you know, hey, we can find a guy, plug him in. It almost it kind of goes back to you don't need to have that high-paid, high-profile running back. You, you know, you're looking at what's going on in Dallas where they drafted Ezekiel Elliott number four overall, and he so far has not lived up to the expectations there. Yeah, and it's early, and I don't want to say Ezekiel's not going to be a good player, but if you remember, I said that was a bad pick, and it wasn't a bad pick because I think Elliott can't be a good player or his talent wasn't worthy of being there. It was a bad pick because the position itself has been devalued, and that's kind of what I just said with Minnesota. Yep. If, if you have Adrian Peterson and you're lining up with the quarterback under center, Uh, and he's seven yards back in an eye formation, he's going to get you 1,800 yards. But what good is it if North Turner's not going to run that offense? Uh, And that's what was going on there. Uh, It goes on throughout the league. You've seen it in Seattle in in recent times when they lost Marshawn Lynch. They didn't miss a beat. Kansas City loses Jamal Charles, and they went on to, I, I think, win 11 straight games at some point last year. Uh, it's you're not saying the the backups are better because they're not, but when you don't rely on the talent of the player, it's not as big as an issue as it might seem on 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 paper. John, uh, other 
uh, some quick other injury notes around the league here as uh, you know we look at. Uh, well, by the way, before we get into some of the other injury quick things, do you think Marshawn Lynch will play this year? Uh, I, I think it's a possibility. I never, I never bought hook, line, and sinker that he wanted to walk away from the game. So uh, if he gets an opportunity, I mean, there's a lot of there's like a lot of injuries it. out there. I mean, would you think that Marshawn Lynch would be a good fit to supplant uh, Peterson in Minnesota? No, like I said, I, I think Norv is very, very happy <laughs> with yeah. that situation. Believe it or not. Uh, they signed Ronnie Hillman actually to be the backup today. Uh, so they're not looking for a running back in that ilk. They, as I said, they had one in that ilk, a very physical big runner. Uh, and that's not what Norv wants at this stage. He wants more of the uh, the three-down guy who can catch the football, run from those offset shotgun looks that we saw uh, DeMarco Murray struggle with here last season. That's what Norv is looking for. That's what he wants, a running back that is comfortable in that type of situation. And McKinnon is a former college quarterback at running uh, zone read and, and, and sort of wildcat and, and at Georgia Southern. So he's got exactly what he wants. All right, John. Uh, a lot of boy. There's a lot of news today uh, all around the league. Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. John McMullen from 97.3 ESPN. Uh, dot com and also covers the league nationally uh, for today's pigskin. Uh, what about the story with Garoppolo here? A lot of uh, reports saying they're pressuring him, trying to throw Tom Brady's toughness in his face to try to make <laughs> him want to play this game. Uh, is there a good chance that we see Garoppolo play tomorrow night, or is this just some Patriot games, uh, you know, to try to take the pressure off of uh, Jacoby Brissett? Normally, I would say it's Patriot mind games, and you want to you want to force Houston to get ready for your entire offense, which would which they would be running with Garoppolo versus a, a rookie quarterback uh, who who is getting his first start and, and doesn't have many reps. Now, but if you think about it, Tom Brady's going to be back in Week Five, so they don't need him to be healthy for 16 games. Uh, if Jimmy Garoppolo was your starter long-term, there's no way they would be pushing him to play in this game. But for the fact they only need him for two more games, I think it's a possibility to trying to push him out on the field and, and trying to instill that toughness and saying, hey, thanks, Jimmy. You got 12 re- <laughs> weeks to rest after this. It would just be so Patriots, though, that even if they – like. If Brissett started the game and Edelman had a finish and he led them to like a two minute drill winning drive. <laughs> well, I mean and it's a shame people, because this know. game this game's a high profile game. Patriots, Texans. I mean, these are two uh, offense against defense. You're talking to a guy who called Bill Belichick the best coach in the history of football uh, on a different radio station earlier this week. So I have a ton of respect for Bill Belichick. Uh, but I got Patriots fans on my Twitter telling me that, that Julian Edelman is a better option at quarterback than signing T.J. Yates or somebody of that nature. And I would just tell people, settle down. Uh, you, you can't expect Julian Edelman to come in and play quarterback at the NFL level because he was once a, a college quarterback at Kent State and – if they, if they need him in an emergency-type situation, you throw him out there, you cross your fingers, and you hope for the best. But the Patriots don't want to do that. They have no interest in doing that. Uh, Belichick is great, but he's not a wizard. Uh, this game is still about the players. All right, John, a lot happened today at uh, Doug's press conference that I think is kind of interesting, including – uh, Zach Ertz, Leotis McKelvin, both out. No real surprise there. I guess a little. Give us a little update. Ertz, we know, uh, was going to be kind of a long shot. Where's McKelvin? Well, McKelvin thought he was close last week, so I, I think it's a little disappointing he wasn't able to get back at least in a limited fashion uh, today, uh, and that's a concern because that's one of the Eagles' weakest positions, and this is a. Uh, we talked about the matchup last week, and it, it, it rare, reared its ugly head once with Alshon Jeffrey down the field. It didn't matter much because 
Chicago's a really bad football team overall. Uh, this week, it's a different story. You have an even better receiver in Antonio Brown. A lot of good compliments, despite the fact that Mar- Martavis Bryant isn't there. Uh, they still have good complementary receivers. Uh, and it's a good football team overall. So they're in a much better position to take advantage of a young quarterback. And it's not just Mills. It's also Ron Brooks. He's not a rookie by any stretch of the imagination, but this is the first time he's ever played significant defensive snaps in the NFL. He was mainly a special teams guy in Buffalo. So that that's a position to watch and and. You need Leotis McKellen out there. Uh, he's their best cornerback. Uh, and, and we talked about that dating back to the offseason work, Mike. This is a position where the Eagles aren't very deep at. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Mills played pretty well. I mean, he has a rookie seventh-round pick uh, to throw him out there. He's really going to be in the spotlight. Uh, I've been impressed with his open field tackling ability. He did miss an open field tackle. He got beat. Uh, on a on a play, you know, you're, that's gonna a hiccup's gonna happen. You're gonna get burned on a play from here to there. But for the most part, he has held out uh, held up pretty well. But this is a different animal facing, you know, possibly getting matched up with Brown. Coach has been really uh, explosive as well. They, I mean, they got weapons here. That I, and I would assume that the the Steelers are gonna try to find ways to get their explosive playmakers, uh, Brown specifically, lined up on Mills because the Eagles aren't a team that switches uh, their you know corners depending on what side of the field you're on. No, nor should they be, because they don't have that type of corner who, who can really trail a receiver like Antonio Brown. And, and that's a guy who also is familiar with moving around. So the, the Steelers use him against everybody. They line him all over the place. And it's like a where's Waldo situation. You always got to find out where he is uh, pre-snap and, and, and make sure he's double covered, because if not, he's going to hurt you. And, and more often than not, He's going to hurt you even if he is double covered. So it, it's a very difficult matchup. But I talked to Jalen today in the locker room, uh, and, and I asked him about that because he's a rookie seventh-round pick. And one week he's got Jeffrey staring at him. The next week it's Brown. And he mentioned you just got to focus on your job. You can't worry about who's lining up outside of you. It, it's always going to be a good player. Uh, it's just going to be really, really good this week. Yeah, and uh, let's jump to uh, one other interesting injury spot because Isaac Sayamalo uh, out with the pec strain. Uh, but we know that the um, Lane Johnson suspension is looming. Many at the beginning of the year figured it was uh, Sayamalo who was going to get that left guard spot when Alan Barbary swings out to right tackle. Will that be the case in week five when the Eagles uh, resume play after that bye? I don't think so. Last week um... – Doug admitted that if it were to happen right now, uh, Stefan Wisniewski would step in. He sort of begged off that a bit and said Sam Alou still has a chance uh, today. But after practice, uh, he was in the locker room with ice. He was not able to go. I still ice in the pack. He's obviously not 100%. Uh, and he wasn't ready anyway if he was 100%. I think that was the Eagles' hope in the preseason. They were sort of throwing him in there to try to kickstart his development and hoping he could be ready. And if he wasn't, they could just go to the savvy old veteran because they knew what they had in Wisniewski. And and that's what it's going to be. There's no doubt in my mind uh, it's going to be Barber at right tackle and Wisniewski at left guard when Lane does get suspended. Uh, And that's the proper way to go because – it's about winning football games. It's not about development now, and that would be the best five you could throw out there. Uh, two quick things uh, from John. Uh, you uh, retweeted Pro Football Focus about Brandon Graham, top graded 4-3 end in the league. Um, and here's a guy who's really thriving with this defense. Yeah, I mentioned it uh, with Scott Grayson yesterday on the show. I mean, he's been tremendous. He's been the Eagles' best uh, defensive lineman, and that's saying a lot when Fletcher Cox is on your team. He, he's played at a really high level. And I think about – you think about the slow development in his career. For a lot of years, Eagle fans just labeled him as a bust because the Eagles could have had Jason Pierre-Paul and they took Brandon Graham. 
and he's just slowly come along and, and, and improved and improved and improved. And he's right there as a, a really, really good defensive end in this league. And, and he's a two-way end. He's not a one-trick pony. He's not a pass rusher. He can set the edge. Uh, he's very good against the run. Uh, and, and I thought this defense would be a perfect fit for him in the offseason. It's turned out early. That's correct. Uh, it, it is a very good fit for him. Uh, and he's one of those under-the-radar guys, and that's funny to say for somebody who was such a high draft choice back in the day that people didn't expect to say, hey, this is, this is one of the four or five best players on this team. But that's where he is right now. I saw a picture at J.F. McMullen of a heavily taped left ankle of Ryan Matthews. Uh, Doug Peterson downplayed it today during uh, the, the press conference, that he's fine, he's just getting treatment. But uh, is there any worries from Ryan Matthews, and potentially is that one of the reasons why we didn't see more of him uh, Monday night late in that game? Yeah, that was the reason. I, I had uh, tweeted a similar photo out last week, and he was never on – the uh, injury report leading up uh, to the Chicago game, but he showed up at practice with that heavily taped ankle, and I took a picture of it and tweeted it out and said, what's going on here? Basically, because the Eagles didn't acknowledge the inju inju injury. Uh, but uh, yesterday, uh, Tuesday, Doug admitted that's why you saw the, uh, the disparage in playing time, and Darren Sproles got significantly more than Ryan Matthews because he wasn't 100% because of that ankle. Still performed pretty well, had the two touchdown runs, but but clearly he's not 100%. And, and here we are Wednesday before the Pittsburgh game, and he's still not 100%. And that's always been the issue with Ryan Matthews. John McMullen, more on the Eagles at 973ESPN.com. And uh, we know we'll dive into this game a lot more on tomorrow's show when the coordinators speak. We'll hear from Frank Reich and uh, Jim Schwartz tomorrow, and we'll have uh, the latest from John always on the website, 973ESPN.com. A lot of NFL news and notes for you here uh, on the Sports Bash. Thanks, John. Hey, thank you, Mike.